If you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're continuing our study in the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, or if you will, to the church at Ephesus, salvation, individual, and corporate. And we have noted as a subtitle that the unity that believers have in Christ brings unity in the church, which is the body of Christ. This is sermon number 87. And we have subtitled this section as our sermon title, The Pauline Ultimate Goal in the Knowing of the Mystery that is given here in Ephesians. This is part three of this section. And this will conclude with sermon number 83, chapter three of our study. Ephesians chapter 3, if you will, let's begin reading at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now we have seen in the context of Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 19, that the Apostle Paul speaks of these great, mysterious revelation that has come, revealing how that the Gentiles shall be a part of the Jewish church. To this, Paul says, we are required to give praise and glory unto God. And so he enters into this prayer, beginning at verse 14, setting forth the very principle that God is to be honored, to be glorified, to be praised in all that he has done. His work of redemption is unilateral. We never must forget that. Though the scripture is often written in a way for us to be able to read, he received. But it does not, and it is not putting the emphasis on the idea that man, because he received had a free will to choose to receive. It's simply recording to us that that act took place. But what is the efficient cause of the act? How could that man who is dead in trespass and sin, a man who cannot respond to spiritual truth, one who is in enmity with God, He does not seek to understand God. He does not seek to obey God. How does that man receive? Well, Paul's made it very clear throughout our first three chapters here. He has received because God has granted it that he could do so. He has set him free through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Thereby, when that Foolishness of the message preached, not foolish preaching. Through that foolishness of the appointed means, the preaching of the word, he would respond because the Spirit of God hath prepared his heart to receive that word and to obey what it demands of him. Believe and repent. His will has been set free from the bondage of sin And he's been given the ability now in the freedom that it has received to pursue righteousness. He no longer is to be a slave to sin. 
now a slave to Jesus Christ. This is what Christ has done for him. This is how they have changed. This is the purpose of God being manifest through their salvation, that they should demonstrate the glory of God in the redemption that he has brought through his Son unto them, calling them through him, through the regenerating power of the Spirit to himself. And so it is, Paul then goes into this prayer and praise of God. And then he comes here in verse 20 and 21 with the final benediction. His goal, he says, is for us to know. And understanding this mystery and what it means for the Jews to have been brought in to the kingdom of God, into the church of Jesus Christ. It is for them to know the love of Christ. A love which knowledge itself cannot give such an assurance, but that intimate relationship through the regenerating work of the Spirit gives them such certainty based on the testimony of the Word and our spirit bearing witness with His Spirit. We are the children of God, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Where there is granted liberty, we have true freedom and liberty in the means of which God intended for us to have it. Well, if you will, let's look at this final benediction here in Ephesians chapter 3, at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. He starts off in this first clause, now to him. The Apostle Paul, having finished his short but most energetic prayer, now brings this doxological closing. The doxology was designed to give recognition to God from whom first all blessings come and secondly to whom all thanks are due to him. Every good thing that comes to us, says James, comes down from the Father of lights. We do not conjure up good things. We're not capable of doing good things. And by that, I mean things as defined as good according to the Scripture. But the blessings that come, they come from God. And because they all come from God, which incorporates within this very structure the whole meaning of soteriology, of salvation. That's what the word means. The fullness of all that we are given in Christ, that we can understand that love which passes all knowledge. As a result, we owe God our thanks. Now he goes on to say, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. It is impossible to express probably the full meaning of these words. But what he's saying here to us is God is omnipotent. Therefore, he is able to do all things. Now, he's not able to do things that are contradictory to his nature. Those are the old philosophical traps that once were so cleverly thought out in order to counter Christianity. Well, if God is so powerful, can he create a rock so big he cannot lift? What you're asking is, can God prove he's not God? And the answer to that is he cannot deny his nature. That's foolish. God is omnipotent. He can do all things. But he does all things according to his own nature. As he is God. He is able to do super abundantly. That is to say, above the greatest abundance that can be imagined. And we are being told here, We must ask first. 
We must come to the Father and ask Him for these things. But who can doubt the promise Paul is giving to us? Who has any rational or scriptural view of His power or of His love? There's only one that is given in the Scripture. It is 1 Timothy 1, 14 through 17. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which were in Christ Jesus. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came in the world to save sinners, of which I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God can do above and beyond what our own expectations are. He does them in a superabundant way. He does it when we are at enmity with Him. We don't often think about that. It's not that we're just down here kind of wandering around trying to figure out what to do in life. The scripture says we are his enemies. We hate the things that he says are right. We hate him because he is the light. We love the darkness, not the light. We are the persecutors of God. We try to stand over against God, to wage war against God as if somehow we might be able to cast God down and destroy and beat Him. It's impossible. That's our nature. That's who we are. That's what we want to be. We want to escape the judgment of God. We will not be told what to do. But my friends, God is so powerful. He does above even our own expectations. When he saves us, he transforms us. The things that we hated, we now love. Does it in the twinkling of an eye. Through that imputation of the Holy Spirit, he is infused within us. He regenerates us. We're changed. We're transformed. We have a new mind, a new desire, a new way that we want to live to please him. We're bound for a different location than we were prior to our salvation. That is a great work of God, is it not? But not only does it end there. In all of this that Paul is drawing out, it is that long-term goal. He has saved us to be his testimonies, his trophies of redemption, that in the fullness of the promise when it comes at the conclusion of the time of the Gentiles in that panorama we talked about earlier. This last frame of the picture now in place. Next event is the coming of Christ. That's the next event. I don't know if it would be next week, a month from now, 10,000 years from now. He just doesn't tell us that. He just says, be prepared. Live righteously as if it was tomorrow. So you do not get caught unaware. But what is the purpose in all this mystery? To make us sons eternally. He wants us to be in the family of God as his own sons. And thus he says, above all that we ask or think. We can ask every good thing. We can ask for the good which 
God has promised in his word. We can think or even imagine, if you will, goods and blessings beyond all that we've even read, per se, or that we've seen. And yes, we can imagine good to which it is impossible for us to even give name to. We can go beyond the limits of all human descriptions. We can imagine more even than God has specified in his word. We can fill no bounds to our imagination of good, but impossibility abounds. After all, we do know this. The promise is God is able to do more for us than we can ask or think. Above and beyond that, in all of our expectations, of all the things we want and we believe and we trust God for, not only named, but the things that are unnamed. God is able to do abundantly more than we ask or think. His ability here is so necessarily compacted with his willingness that the one indisputably indisputable principle is that it implies the other must be included. Of what consequence would it be to tell the church of God that God has the power to do such and such if there were not implied an assurance that he does it and he goes beyond in his power those things that are even beyond the desires of the soul of men he is able to carry out and do. This is a God who is trying to assure us we can have full trust in his promise. That's what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter. When they begin to talk about, well, where is his coming? Here comes all the gainsayers. Hey, did not Jesus Christ promise this? Well, where is the promise coming? He hasn't returned yet. Looks like you've been left behind. He's gone. You're not going to be saved after all. What does Peter say? He says, shame on you for considering God to be slothful in his actions. Repent, all of you who have trusted God. Repent from your doubting. Turn, know this, what he's promised he delivers. Again, this is what Paul is trying to say in the doxology here. God is to be praised because he meets not only those things that he promises, but even our expectations that seem to be beyond all that we can imagine that we would see as good. Often he meets those things because he is able to do more than we can think or ask. I don't know how many times people have said, To me, I cannot believe what God has done in my life. The things that he has blessed me. I never dreamed this. I never thought about this. I never knew this path could be my path. That's the power of our God. 2 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11 says, Therefore, brethren, Be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you notice that how many times that concept of abundant beyond your expectations. All those phrasings in Scripture are descriptions of how our God loves us, meets, grants, and gives us beyond what we even considered. How many times have we prayed and asked God, help me to get here. If you can just get me here, God, we can make it. And a year later, you're not there. You're beyond it. You've experienced it. It's beyond what you've asked. We're to be faithful. 
Paul says, we remain faithful because we remember who has done these things for us. And we remember his promises are true. And his calling upon us is true with all the benefits and the blessings that have been offered to us. So he continues, according to the power that now works in us. All that he can do and all that he has promised, of course, is going to be done. But he does it by that power of the Spirit which works in us. Through that regenerating work, the work is carried out and completed. It is not completed of our own ability, yet it takes within its scope the whole man responding. He's regenerated both in his soul and his body is attached to Christ. The expectation is to respond, meet the demands of God's expectations. But we can't do it our own ability. That's the point. It has to be done through the power that indwells us, the Holy Spirit. That's why the Apostle Paul says, do not grieve the Spirit. Do not fight against that where he wants to take us. There's a remnant of sin left. The Scripture makes it very clear over and over. We're sinners saved by grace. Paul says there is going to be this ongoing war that never ends. Our job is to kill sin and to put on the righteousness of Christ, to walk in the path that he has ordained for us in those good works that we have been ordained unto to perform. It's not the Spirit who just performs them. We perform them through the power of the Spirit. Spirit acts with energy within our hearts, expelling evil, purifying, and refining the affections and the desires of men and implants within us the desires for good and righteousness. Paul told us this. Do you remember Ephesians chapter 1 when he spoke about this very thing? I mean, he lays out in the foundation the principles that he's now expounding upon with greater clarity. But remember what he said beginning at verse 15 of chapter 1. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that your eyes of, un your, of your understanding being enlightened, that you may understand exactly what has taken place in you you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might, and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's worked all this through Christ in us. He's poured it out upon us. He's given us this ability. Our failures are due to our lack of believing and trusting what he has declared in his word. I never forget reading Marcellus Kick's book dealing with Revelation chapter 20. And he says, the problem with Christianity in the church today is they have not come to the reality that Satan has been bound. Christian has been set free by Christ. Satan is bound. He's bound by a chain, and he could be bound even tighter, but we do not do it. 
we let the opportunity go by because we doubt and we sin and we don't put our priorities in the way that God tells us to do so. He's granted us the freedom. He has granted us access to the power through his spirit. The question is, why aren't we responding in the right way? Paul wrote in Colossians 1, beginning at verse 24, Now I rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affections of, affections of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations now has been revealed to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's the mystery. Gentiles have Christ in them. The hope of glory. Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, what? Perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. He grants above and beyond. It is exceedingly, abundantly, there for the asking, there for the living of the life that he has called us into. And then he continues in verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Again, to him and to God, the Father, who has bestowed these blessings that he's told us about through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, he's saying, is due to him alone. Because he is this efficient cause of these things granted spiritually to us without us earning them. They are truly of God's grace. They are the unmerited favors of God. They are the unmerited blessings of God poured out upon us. We who were chosen before the foundation of the world for this very thing. Do you remember Paul laid that principle out? Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So to him belongs that glory. It's the purpose of God being revealed. How can we not but glorify God for what he has done in Christ through us? He says, be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ. Since we are possessed of power and goodness of his spirit, there is to be, therefore, honor, glory, praise given to God the Father in his church. Listen to the teaching of Scripture. Romans eleven thirty six. 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever, all men. Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandments of the everlasting God who for, or excuse me, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Again, Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. 
grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that we might that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father to whom belong glory forever and ever. Can you not see the plan of God has been that in the redemption of the saints he through Christ receives the glory, and the honor. These are his blessings to us. There is therefore to be this unceasing praise ascribed in all the assemblies of God's people. Wherever these glad tidings are preached, blessings are poured out. Wherever this glorious doctrine is desired and testified to and is lived out daily, The church ought to be praising God the Father. But how many days do we go by without thinking about what we have been saved from? We can find everything in this world to detract us from what God has called us to do. We can walk so many days that we do not even think about the things of God. We're so caught up in our busy lives. We neglect our prayer life. We neglect our study of the word. We neglect our duties as husbands, wives, children within the homes who have their duties and are responsible to their parents before God. We do not. We do not simply keep ourselves focused on the blessings that have come from God the Father. And when we don't do that, we don't praise him. But we're called to meditate upon these things day and night. We're called upon to make praise and glory. Honor him. Every word he says we're going to be accountable for. Every thought and every deed. Unto Jesus Christ, through whom and for whom, All these miracles of mercy and power have been wrought in us. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind think the way you should think because you are in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbles himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What? To the glory of God the Father. Should that not be our understanding of the blessings of God? And ought we not to constantly be praising and glorifying him? Philippians 4, 20 through 21. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in the Jesus Christ. The brethren who are with me greet you. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And then Paul continues, and he says here in verse 21, to all generations, may we praise God in this outpouring of blessings that have been revealed that is coming unto the Gentiles throughout their generations. 
may this continue to be the praise of the church. Our God is in the business of saving souls. Our God is in the business of redeeming us through his Son. And that work, that kingdom, expands, grows, and it will grow till it covers the earth. That's the promise. To all generations forever and ever. Amen. Through all the succeeding generations. While the race of human beings continue to exist on the face of the earth, we know, we praise God, not just for those in the past who were delivered, not for just our deliverance, but for those we know who will be delivered one day. One day the bride will be complete. One day the church will be perfected forever in Jesus Christ. That is our hope. Listen to Hebrews 13. Paul writes, beginning at verse 10, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacles have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We're moving from Jerusalem to the completion of the one true city of God. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Well, he goes on then to say, forever and ever world without end at the end here. Throughout eternity, Paul's making this stress. In the coming world as well as in this world, he's emphasizing the song of praise which has begun upon the earth that is protracted through the generations of men from the very beginning of time to the final consummation, may it be continued in heaven by all that are redeemed from the earth, whereas we are for here limited, but then we will be unfettered forever because our sins will have been completely removed. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have that same emphasis at the end of the doxology. It is a world going forth, the mystery been revealed. We cannot but understand God's army marches to its final order. We are more than conquerors through him. Our job. I was talking to a young man who's considering coming into the seminary, and I was talking to him about one of the things that I think we've lost in the church of Jesus Christ, and that's the concept of community. The church we see more almost as a Roman Catholic concept of gathering in, fellowshipping, and going out. That's it. You go back to Calvin Geneva. The idea was that the Christians, they were the ones with the oversight of the pastors and the deacons of the church. They established the hospitals. They established the orphanages. They established the hospices. They established so much. They seen their duty is to bring the community under the authority, the teaching, and the practice of Christ, which included their government, how they ought to govern themselves. We've lost that. We don't see it. 
It's commanded. We ought to be looking toward that very end. We don't stop here, Paul says. We look forward knowing what has been promised. It does not stop. It does not end. That's why we praise God. We cannot be defeated. The church cannot be wiped from the face of the earth. It is impossible, except at the end of time. And thus he ends with that word, amen. So be it. That is, as it shall be. Thus for all the counsel of God, for all the faithfulness and the truth that he has given to us, not one jot, not one tittle of the promise has failed us. From the foundation of the world to our present day, to the world that is yet to come, to pass. Nor can it fail. It will not cease until mortality is swallowed up into eternal glory. Therefore, he says to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to them be glory. To them be the dominion. That responsibility of overtaking, transforming the power and the thanksgiving from now and henceforth forever to the very end, so be it, or if you will, as it shall be. John Gilt writes, I want to quote this in my conclusion concerning verse 21, and I thought he said it so well. <clears throat> I kind of threw it in at the end because I hadn't looked it up. I was just going through and looking at the text of the Scripture. But I seen it, and I thought, what a wonderful picture he draws of this verse. He says, the apostle concludes his prayer, and it really incorporates 20 and 21 because they are the doxology together. The apostle concludes his prayer, glory is to be given to God on account of his perfections, which are to be celebrated and on account of the works of creation and providence, which are to be commended and acquiesced in, and on account of temporal mercies, for which thanks should be given, and especially for spiritual mercies, and above all, for Jesus Christ. The glory of salvation from first to last is to be ascribed to his free grace, and his worship is to be regarded and constantly attended on. Faith is to be exercised in him as a promising and a covenant-keeping God. And our lives and our conversations are to be ordered aright according to his word. Why has he made known the mystery to us? that we should know how to live for him from now until the kingdom is eternally established. That we would do good, that we would seek what is right, not what we want, but knowing that when we desire the things of God, he even gives us above what we desire. Often we have more than we could have ever asked for. We just don't think about what God has given us. Oh, we say we're saved, and we don't have to live in the world of sin. But my friends, it's more than that. It's not only being drawn away from the world of sin, but it's the promise that the day is coming when we will not ever know sin again. Nothing but the love, the fellowship, the intimacy that only can be experienced when we have passed from this life to the next or when we hit the end of time and it is all put together in eternity. Till then, we just 
we think now that we've got it good because we're saved, you haven't experienced yet what is coming completely. It's hard to imagine. But it looks so great from this side when we're told about it. Our goal is to be there. Our goal is to be a part of this unfolding mystery of the Gentiles. To preach that gospel of Christ. To declare him. To praise him. To give honor and glory in our assemblies. It is not us. It is not about us. It is about God, his purpose, and his son, Jesus Christ, and the power that has been given to us to recognize, honor, and glorify him in all that we think and do. The question is, are we putting forth that effort? Now understand, Paul poises this at the end of chapter 3, because you know what he's going to do for the next three chapters? He's going to tell you how this ought to be lived out. Now comes practical doctrine. The praxis of the church. Now that I've told you the doctrine, you should understand the very purpose of God and redemption, your salvation in living out your life, and the glory, the praise you ought to give to him. And what does that look like externally in your life? Chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6 is where he's going to explain it. Personally, within your life, within your church, within your family, within your nation, all the principles are there for us to live by. That's what he set us up for here. That's what all this is leading to. With these blessings comes great responsibilities. May we seek the honor, the glory that belongs to God alone in all these things. May we uplift him. May we glorify his holy name in all that we are seeking to do and to honor him with in this time as we gather every week. Not to forget this. Every week we come, we see the table of our Lord. What is the expectation of that very thing? It is that we are reminded from which we have been redeemed to what we have been promised in that redemption and that we are to live in a way that honors and glorifies him. It's never about us. It's always about him. If we change that, we will veer from our path that God has given to us to live and to think and to act upon daily. May God grant us the grace to focus, to continue to be faithful in our glorifying of him. The daily we glorify, daily we honor, daily we uphold the grace and the strength and the honor that's due unto him. Shall we pray?